I'm in southern Baja, going north from Cabo San Lucas toward a place called Todos Santos. And on my way through the desert cactus, out in the middle of nowhere, is a mirage. Well, it's not a true mirage, but a man-made oasis that seems to just spring out of nowhere and offer great promise. Appropriately, it's called Art and Beer. The place is filled with some pretty crazy sculptures and music. But from what I've been told, the folks at Art and Beer serve some really good food and drink. It's a place that you have to see or experience to believe. I had no idea what to expect from this place. I mean, it's just cut right out of a chunk of desert thicket right beside the highway. But somebody told me that the food was really good here, especially the tostadas and, well, the margaritas, which are impressive, as are the tostadas, simply for their size. But you know what? That margarita is made with fresh mango, and it's really delicious. Smoked marlin tostada, just piled high. Looks like it's got a little bit of mayonnaise. Mm. Oh, that's, that's delicious. They've got few sauces here. I'm going to put a little bit of chipotle on there. She promised me that they were really spicy sauces, mm. which is just what I wanted. Real roasty, dark flavor. Everything is so fresh. Everything is so light and beautiful. Oh, you could just stay here all day long. But I was still a few miles south of my ultimate destination the town of Todos Santos. Todos Santos is on the Pacific side of the Baja Peninsula, and it too is an oasis, a true oasis, of lush green palms and other kind of tropical vegetation sprouting up from the dry and sandy terrain. A drive through the streets of Todos Santos is like taking a course in the history and culture of this really unique little town. It's a place that's seen several cycles of prosperity and hardship, dating from the time it was settled in the early 18th century. I checked into the legendary Hotel California, humming songs I hadn't thought of since I was a kid. I was ready for a relaxing evening in this beautiful place. The next morning I met up with my friend Sergio Jarvegui, one of the most passionate naturalists and guides in the area. He has such an intimate knowledge of why so many people flock to Todos Santos. Todos Santos is not exactly what I expected when I got here. There's all these art galleries and it just seems like um, a different kind of town. Well, Todos Santos now is a, it's a magic town. It's more of an artist community. What do you mean by magic town? The nicest towns in Mexico they, uh, they put the denomination magic. And so they have a, a special atmosphere. They have to have a, a, an extra special something to be named the magic towns. And here it's all this artist colony that's sort of developing here and the history? Correct, it's part of history, part of the artist, and part of the magic of the light. The, the quality of the light is very different. But talking about history, that's a very interesting point. Around 1850, a couple of Cuban guys came and started the sugar cane business. Oh, okay. Because there was water here, fresh water. There was enough water and the sun. And then in 1950, more or less, um, the people said in Todos Santos that it was a big earthquake. And that earthquake dried completely the aquifer. Oh, so all the water went all away. All the water died <laughs> completely. So all the sugar cane dies, and Todos Santos becomes a ghost town, literally a ghost town. And then in 1975, water comes back. And then people start coming this way because look at the weather. The weather is perfect. So that's what, wh why there's a rebirth of it now as this magic town here exactly. in Mexico. Now, while the sugarcane industry may be a part of Todos Santos' distant past, the sweets tradition is still very much alive. Sergio took me to this popular collection of little roadside stalls at the edge of town that sells the vast array of local specialties. Oh, 
yes. <laughs> this is this is a, a beautiful sweets tradition. This ah. one I don't know. What is that? Sugar in a form called charamusca. Charamusca or trompada. Trompada oh, that sounds like it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it must be really hard it stuff. Is really you just hard. break it off. Or a teeth. Yeah. Or, <laughs> this is the Damiana herb, right? Yeah, this is the one that in Todos Santos they say is aphrodisiac, and people drink it almost every day. An aphrodisiac of uh, Todos Santos. Yes. And they make tea out of it? Tea. Or uh, an alcoholic beverage. An alcoholic beverage mm -hmm. as well. Of wow. course. Yeah. But it looks like the big thing here must be these little uh, empanadas, right? The specialty right? in this place, the thing they really like here is cajeta. Cajeta. Cajeta is, is what everybody buys. I can see them making them all over oh, there. Wow. They're all folding them up and yeah. making that beautiful little rope edge. Super light, kind of, flaky crust. And this is kind of like a tortilla de harina, the same kind of material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is really good. Muchísimas gracias, señor. Muchas gracias. Because of the rare fresh water sources that exist here, the area around Todos Santos is a major agricultural spot. Sergio and I stopped at one of the local organic farms. They grow all kinds of produce here, from lettuce and New Zealand spinach to beautiful ripe strawberries, red bananas, and what may seem like a no-brainer in this arid terrain, nopal cactus. They grow a relatively spineless variety of nopal that they pick very young when it's totally delicious and tender. There are many delicious ways to prepare nopal, but Sergio knew of a place in town, tucked in the back of a tiny convenience store, that uses them in a unique way. They infuse handmade tortillas with a puree of nopal. Juan starts by making a pretty standard wheat flour dough for his tortillas. Then he slices up some nopal, scoops it into a blender, adds a little water, and blends it until it's completely smooth. If it isn't smooth, the tortillas will fall apart when he presses them out. Then he works the nopal mixture, along with some additional flour, into that tortilla dough. There's a final luxurious touch. Juan works some garlic butter into the dough. And when it's smooth and homogenous, he puts the dough into a press that portions it into equal-sized pieces that get rolled into little balls. Next, the balls of cactus-flavored tortilla dough get flattened on a heated press before they're tossed onto a hot griddle where Juan's wife, Maria, manages the baking and flipping and cooling. No. <laughs> Garlic butter, and then that little hint of the nopal. That very little bit, it's very subtle. It's subtle, it's, it's a little green. Cactus isn't the only classic desert food, though I have to admit there's a lot of it here to cook. Sergio and I drove miles and miles on rutted dirt roads through all that cactus and through mesquite thickets to reach our next stop, the home of Doña Ramona and her family. These folks are experts in making a rustic desert cuisine, especially that iconic dish they called machaca, the dish that features dried beef. Rick, Rick ah, Bailey's, Doña Ramona. Mucho gusto. Doña Ramona showed us the cut of local grass-fed beef that they use for machaca, while her son Antonio demonstrated how to slice and salt the meat. The meat then gets hung up for three or four days to dry in a small screened-in structure. Remember, it's really warm and dry here. Antonio brought in some beef that had been hanging for a few days and was dry enough for us to use for machaca. Berta laid the dried meat over hot coals to heat it through and crisp it a little. Then she dropped the meat into water to soften it. That was something I'd never seen done before. And finally, the pounding, the machacando, from which this machaca dish gets its name. It's stone against stone, 
crushing the fibers of the dried meat into a sort of fluffy looking mass. Berta also pounded a clove of garlic into the meat to enhance its flavor. While we were taking care of the meat, Concepcion, Doña Ramona's daughter-in-law, had been chopping up some onions and poblano. In a clay cazuela, and this is a cazuela that Doña Ramona had made herself, the onion and poblano were cooked in lard over an open fire on an earthen hearth that Doña Ramona's husband had made for her a half century ago when they were first married. Finally, the pounded meat was stirred into the cazuela. While the machaco was cooking, Berta made a nopal dish with dried guajillo chilies and fresh cheese. It was the perfect deserty accompaniment to that machaca. El sabor es increíble. What I love about it is that the flavor of the meat. It was so rich and the lard that they've rendered from the little pigs around here. Oh yeah. <laughs> I really like good. the texture, it's kind of crunchy. Mm -hmm. Well, because they pounded it and then yeah. fried it till it's kind of yeah. crispy, crunchy. Really, really good. You know, you could probably say that taking dried beef and pounding it into that fluffy looking mixture is one of the most unusual techniques that you would find in any cuisine anywhere in the world. Got some friends that wanted to see how to do it, so I invited them over. But I thought I would put something adventurous with it as well. You know, most people would say cooking cactus is an unusual technique, but it's really pretty straightforward if you know what to do with the cactus paddles. They're really simple to work with. Grab one with a pair of tongs. You have to clean it of all of the spines, all of the nodes. So you go around the perimeter of that cactus. And then I always hold it with a pair of tongs and hold my knife perpendicular and scrape off all the nodes. You have to do this carefully and without too much pressure. You don't want to cut into the cactus. And when the cactus is completely clean, I'm going to cut it into about half inch pieces. Well, it doesn't take too long to clean a cactus paddle and dice it up like that. But if you happen to live anywhere near a Mexican grocery store, you can go into the produce section and usually you'll find the cactus already cleaned for you and diced up, which is what I'm going to use here. The cactus dish that I'm going to make for you, it's seasoned with dried guajillo chilies and roasted garlic and a little bit of roasted tomato. The first thing that we have to do is to prepare the guajillo chilies. I've got a little garlic dry roasting in the skillet until it's completely soft. And over kind of medium heat here, I'm gonna to toast guajillo chilies. They need to be cleaned first. I'm gonna pull off the stem end and then just tear them open. And then you toast them in your skillet, pressing them down. You'll hear a little sizzle like that. And then flip them over. You'll notice a slight color change there. And after a few seconds more, when they become very aromatic, they're toasted and ready to go. I've got two more of them to clean here and toast. Okay, I'm gonna tear these guys up and put them into the blender jar along with the roasted garlic. The garlic has cooled off enough now that the papery skin just comes right off of the roasted cloves. And though I could start with fresh ripe tomatoes and roast them, I'm a huge fan of uh, the canned fire roasted tomatoes because they give me a lot of the flavor, but very easy to work with. I'm gonna add about a half a can 
of the tomatoes to the blender, undrained. Put the top on and make a puree. And I'm going to start the pot for cooking the cactus. A little olive oil goes in there to warm. I'm going to slice an onion. The onions are going to go into the pan with the olive oil, and I'm going to cook them over medium to medium high until they begin to brown. We want this cooking to go pretty quickly because we don't want the onions to soften too much before they brown. And now I'm going to add the prepared cactus to it. Now here's where the magic happens. I'm gonna put the top on it and let that cook over about a medium heat for five minutes. What's gonna happen during that period is all the sticky stuff, the mucilaginous part of the cactus will just come out in the paint, you'll see. Now in that steamy environment, all of that undesirable sticky substance was all let out. But then as I stir it for the next few minutes, it'll all evaporate, turning this dish into something that's really beautiful, light and crunchy, almost like, I'd say kind of like a green bean, but with a lemony kind of flavor to it. Scrape in tomato chili. Boy, I can smell that chili. This is going to take about 15 minutes or so to reduce to the consistency of tomato paste. About a half a cup of water. Turn down the temperature to medium low and let that simmer for a few minutes for all those flavors to come together beautifully. I have some friends, Stephen and Jennifer, who are adventurous cooks and wanted to learn the details of making a very traditional machaca. So I invited them over for a quick little lesson. I mean, rustic as it is, it's really quite simple when you start with some dried beef, what's called carne seca in the Mexican grocery store, or with some good quality beef jerky. Then heat it on the grill or under your stove's broiler for just a few minutes until it's a little bit crispy. It cools down a little bit. We'll start to rip it up into, into little bits here. Now, this is the point at which the fun part starts. So when, when I learned to do this in Mexico, it was all done stone against stone. Special river rock that was used to pound this into this light fluffy thing. This is a Thai mortar and it will work really well for the same kind of thing. So if you're game to help me with this, well I'm going to show you first how to do this thing. So you tear the pieces in small like that. Uh, because you're going to try to reduce this now into little fluffy bits. This is more or less what I think you want it to look like. Well, it fine like that? Yeah, or? But it should look kind of powdery, but you should be able to see some of the fibers. So I'm going to tear this up if you don't mind starting to pound on this. Sure. Or you'll get the, this is the real deal. This is the authentic way to do it. So I'll let you start with that amount of it there. And you'll notice that if you just pound like this, it'll be okay. But if you push it down as you're pounding and kind of twist, It'll take less of your movement. Okay, so while you're doing that, I'm gonna to get together all the rest of the ingredients to turn this shredded jerky into a filling. So first I gotta roast and peel and clean and dice up some poblano chilies. Then chop up some tomatoes, chop some onion, and then finally mince up some garlic. Okay, now that you've been so patient and done this incredible job, let me show you another way that you can do the shredding of the jerky. Um, it, you tear up the crispy pieces. Now they've gotten very crisp as they've cooled off from the broiler. <laughs> Put that into the blender jar. 
And then I always started out by pulsing it on a low speed. Now let me show you how this comes out. It's a little bit different. But I'm gonna just pour it out right next to the other. Well, for sure the color's a little bit different, right? And you're gonna have to, it's a little finer, but it'll still give you a lot of that same kind of feeling, that same kind of flavor that you would get out of the other one. But I have to say, if you're just not in the mood <laughs> to do all that pounding, <laughs> then the blender can be your friend. Okay, so now we're on to the making of the filling. When the meat is ready, Heat some olive oil in a pan and then add a spoonful of fresh rendered pork lard. When the lard is melted and is hot, add some onions. And then when they're browned, add the pounded and fluffy looking dried beef. Then stir everything together until the meat turns a lighter, sort of nutty looking brown and is very aromatic. Then add the poblano, tomato, and garlic and let everything cook, stirring it frequently until the mixture comes together. Do you put those down until the tomatoes have almost disintegrated? Yes, or? and they will become sort of sauce-like in this mixture. I heated up some fresh-made herb-infused flour tortillas to serve with that nopal dish that I had made earlier. All the dish needed was a little sprinkling of fresh cheese to finish it off. And I filled the rest of the tortillas with some of our gutsy, rustic, delicious machaca. Okay, you have the classic Baja burritos de machaca, but they're not just any machaca burritos here because these are done in a special flour tortilla that's flavored with cilantro, garlic, a little rosemary, something that we learned when we were in Baja. You cannot leave Todos Santos without one good drink from here. <laughs> okay. So first of all, yes. I'm going to introduce you to Chef Danny. Hi, Chef. Hi, Chef. Hi, Chef. How are you doing? Hi, Chef. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Welcome to the I'm Hotel I'm looking California. forward to a good drink here. Absolutely. And I hear you're the master. What do you have? Well, I can make you a classic margarita, yeah. which is... That's uh, my favorite. Yeah, with Damiana okay. base. And then I can make you a creative one, which will surprise. I'm I know you're... completely okay. in your hands. Oh, perfect. Let's start with the regular one. That's the Damiana liquor I, I was telling you about. Oh, this sprig of rosemary. There's so much rosemary around here. Our special today is a creative uh, Jamaica agave and vanilla margarita. Salud. Salud! And salute salud to you too, Chef Danny. Chef Danny, enjoy. Boy, I've got, that is so delicious, I've got all kinds of questions. First, tell me about what the rimming is here, because it's kind of spicy and kind of sweet. I make some salt, some sugar in the raw, mm -hmm. and spicy chilies. The vanilla in there is so soft and rich and round and it goes beautifully with all those spices. This is, I have to say, this is probably one of the best margaritas I've ever had in oh, my right. life. I'm it's really, like it. really all delicious. Right. This is great. <laughs> 